He's also a gold sponsor, you know, friend of the chapter, and he's a session chair too. He's been integral in pulling together this technical program, and he's the reason why Milos is giving our keynote speech today. So without further ado, please welcome Jim. Thank you. So last year I had the opportunity to uh, attend a, a talk where Milos was speaking, and he gave a very fantastic talk. It was really interesting to the audience, and uh, it was a very, very fascinating and very informative. And so I really uh, had a strong suggestion that we bring him here to talk to your uh, chapter meeting today. So Milos is an associate professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering at Boston University. He's a principal investigator in the BU Photonics Center, where he leads the Silicon Photonics Research Group. He's a co-founder and technical advisor of um, IR Labs. He, uh, that's a company that's developing photonic in-package I.O. based uh, on technology developed in his working group. His research group uh, works on theory and design of new integrated photonic devices and systems, and on the monolithic integration of photonics and CMOS electronics to demonstrate the new electronic photonic integrated systems. He is an author and co-author of over 40 patents, 250 journal articles, uh, and conference papers, and in 2012, he was a fellow of the Packard Foundation. Uh, Milush received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Queen's University in Canada, and his MS and PhD from MIT. And I think we're very, very uh, lucky to have him come speak with us today. So please, let's give a very warm welcome to Milos Popovic. Thank you very much, Jim, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, having me here. Um, thanks also, Jim, for setting the bar high for me. <laughs> um, so um, I'm coming here uh, as, as a student, I would say, uh, because my usual uh, area of work is not packaging, uh, and so I'm very interested to see what this community is doing, uh, and it's, uh, it's an area that's very important to uh, integrate photonics and electronics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's happening in, in uh, electronics and photonics and the integration of these technologies in new microchips. and. Um, uh, I'll focus mostly on what's going on in my group because I have access to that and, and some of the technology that was uh, commercialized, but hopefully you'll get an idea of uh, what's happening in this space. It's a very, I think, exciting um, time for, for microelectronics. So, um, the BU Photonic Center, um, if you are interested in this and, and you're around the area, feel free to drop by and visit us. About 30 research groups doing work in, in photonics there, uh, and uh, my grad students who have done a lot of this work. So um, one um, thing I just want to start with is where photonics is going from, from one perspective. Um, what, here we have one session I saw on, on uh, photonic integrated circuits or related to photonic integrated circuits, so it's uh, already a topic being addressed by this conference. Uh, but I just want to give you some context for uh, how electronics is developed and how photonic integrated circuits are developing a little differently. Um, so, uh, just you know, your smartphone has about a um, 100 gigablops, and that's about the same power as uh, the fastest supercomputer in the world 25 years ago. And um, so, obviously, Moore's law has uh, made the supercomputers much faster today, but it's something to keep in mind that uh, the pace of progress of, of microelectronics uh, has been extremely fast. And um, so, you know, a, another uh, Moore's Law slide here to show the number of transistors on a chip since, uh, let's say, 25 years ago. That was about 1990 to today. So what I'm trying to show you here is, um, and this is another way to look at it, that uh, this was enabled by transistors going from 10 microns to sort of sub-50 and sub-10 nanometer nowadays in size. Um, so here you have year and size of the transistor gate. 
And uh, what I'm trying to show here is, uh, you know, we started out with, let's say, one micron sized transistors in 1990, and now we're down to sub 10 nanometer sized transistors. So, you know, that's a, a factor of at least 100x in size. On the other hand, um, integrated photonics has little waveguides and uh, beam splitters and uh, interferometers and resonators integrated on a single silicon chip. And so here you can see a picture of one of these. Even though we, we're building circuits with them today, this is from 1995. So the first um, microring resonator built in a silicon chip. So it's about, uh, it's, you can think of it kind of like uh, the transistor of integrated photonics in the sense that it's one of the building blocks. Uh, integrated photonics is a little bit more diverse than, than digital logic, let's say, but, so there are multiple types of devices. But uh, so this is about, um, about five microns in radius. And um, 1992, uh, gallium arsenide also, another group at Northwestern. This was actually at MIT, by the way. Uh, I think the uh, line of Kimmel Kimmerling's group and some others. And um, so now look, to, to 2023, and so here's a, a, a microring resonator based optical modulator that translates a signal from the electrical to the optical domain. So it's also five microns in size. So um, there's no scaling in optics. It's already at the wavelength scale. So what, what we are changing is in 1990, the uh, um, optical loss of light running around this uh, resonator was high, so the quality factors were in the order of 200 or 5,000, which is the center of wavelength divided by the line width. Um, and, um, and nowadays, they can be half a million or, e or even 5 to 10 million. So it just means that the wavebed loss is much lower. And I guess my only point with this is that the vectors along which uh, microelectronics technology and integrated optics has been improving are different. And so you can't expect to um, design and integrate integrated photonics in the same way. So it's not about scaling more and more optical devices in a smaller and smaller space. Can you guys hear me? I'm competing here. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I just want to give you a couple of uh, possible um, a couple of the applications that are coming up already in industry uh, for uh, photonic integrated circuits. This is uh, this one uh, illustration here from um, Kurt Bresnicker, who's uh, an architect at HP uh, Labs, uh, pointing out that we're creating data at an exponential rate today. Um, and uh, the compute capability is growing, but not as fast as the rate of data generation. And so what it means is, as some of you may, may be following, the, um, the, the progress of designing compute, compute hardware is slower than our ability to get data in and out. And so one of the major motivators for using photonics is to make uh, data I.O. much more efficient. So getting more data out per unit, sort of perimeter of the chip or area of the chip, as well as doing it energy efficiently so that you can still stay, stay within the power envelope of um, the chip package. So that's one of the main drivers for integrated optics. But um, there are many, several others. And you know, there's a lot going on in, in the research domain in, in universities. But the primary drivers in application in industry, uh, I'd say, are, are these four. So cloud computing, uh, which would be data centers, so the hyperscalers that are trying to, you know, Facebook and Google and so on. Uh, AI and HPC, um, 5G and 6G wireless, and uh, sort of uh, you can call intel the intelligent edge or edge uh, edge of network computing. So um, cloud computing, the main uh, trend is that uh, you have now 
data centers wanting to pool their compute resources, pool their memory, and pool their hard drives. And uh, making that possible requires getting very low cost, energy cost sort of, and latency cost uh, data movement. So the standard thing is you have a rack of um, uh, servers, and each server has a sort of motherboard, and the motherboard has two sockets, each with a processor and some memory surrounding it and so on. And so what um, a lot of these data centers are finding is that they have to design their data center for the worst case load, so they have to buy a pile of memory and then they use 2% of it. And so the point is they, they want to pool all the memory so that, that you can basically reallocate smoothly between these things. So that whole paradigm shift is waiting for an interconnect technology that can make um, this, uh, this possible. And optics is making headway into this, and there's already a lot of work uh, in the industry on, on, this, uh, on, on this problem. Um, uh, AI HPC, so I'm sure you're following the uh, very interesting and sometimes scary things that these uh, AI models are doing, chat GPT and, and whatever. And um, you know, uh, this GPT model takes $10 million and several months of computing running on a whole data center to train up. So as people are going to bigger models, you need to um, generate a, a lot of compute capability. And getting data in and out uh, of the processors is, again, one of the big problems. And so optical communication uh, is, again, one of the uh, important technologies that you need to develop to, um, to make that possible. And in this case, you really have uh, you know, high performance chips that have very high density I.O. and you can't really get onto a printed circuit board uh, with sort of low density wiring and get out. You need to keep that high pitch, high density. And so what you really need are, now that uh, the semiconductor industry has moved to the chiplet paradigm, so having multiple chiplets integrated in the same package, you need little optical chiplets to get that data out without ever going to a low density. Um, and so the point is you can move data maybe a couple of millimeters uh, in the electrical domain and then, and then uh, uh, trans trans transition it to optics and get it out via optical fiber. And the nice thing about optical fiber is you have tens of terahertz of bandwidth in a single strand of fiber and you just need to be able to populate that bandwidth. And so the whole business of photonic integrated circuits and research and development in them is to do that and do that efficiently. Um, then probably the next wave uh, of applications would be 5 and 6G uh, wireless and uh, disaggregating base stations uh, where there's a lot of RF bandwidth uh, phased array antennas that are collecting, uh, you know, trying to beamform and figure out from which direction an RF signal is coming. And um, uh, the idea is that instead of having analog to digital converters, you can, uh, at, at the phaser antenna, you can take all of the elements of the antenna, take the data into the optical domain, take that to the base station, basically same sort of uh, pooling and, and uh, aggregation that, that I mentioned for, for uh, sort of the digital compute and data, data centers. Uh, and then this other category would be things like uh, radar or sensors or, um, sort of small devices at the edge of the network that can do some processing and, um, and, and sort of re reduce the amount of computation at central, uh, central nodes. So all of this uh, calls for, for optical technology. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, optical communication technology that, 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 was, um, that we've been developing and then it was spun out into IR Labs, which is a more sort of industry facing Problem. And then I'll show you a couple of examples of um, uh, academic research in, in these other directions uh, from sort of nearer term to more crazy. And I, I guess my hope is at the end maybe to stimulate some discussion about where the uh, packaging expertise and community can play a role in this. Um, so this is my uh, answer to that first slide where I showed you that the transistors have been scaling and the uh, photonics have not. So uh, 
the idea is that one perspective on, on integrated photonics is to think of it as a, as a more than more technology, meaning that it's adding to the CMOS semiconductor uh, platforms new, new capabilities, new degrees of freedom. And so examples are, for example, in, uh, the, in the 90s, people uh, took a, a digital CMOS chip and added uh, inductors in just the back end, metal wiring, sys managing to satisfy the design rules and realize an inductor approximation within the foundry and not having to sort of tack one on afterwards. And so that led to um, uh, CMOS radios and you know, as soon as you can do something in silicon, then it goes, uh, it goes mass market and that's the, the way you do it for large volume applications. And then, um, then people figured out, for example, how to do transmission lines and build uh, high frequency amplifiers and so some RF CMOS is now done in, in silicon. And, you know, these silicon technologies can go up to hundreds of gigahertz in, in cutoff frequency. Even, even if they're not suitable for everything like power amplifiers. Um, so uh, what we try to do uh, in looking at integrated photonics is to build waveguides and resonators and other optical components, but within uh, a CMOS process just like these, so that you can leverage um, all of the existing capabilities and build systems that now include optical components. And so that was uh, the point of view uh, that, that we took uh, about 10 or, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, and so I'll just show you how that has evolved. Um, so I, this is a, a busy slide just saying that uh, it's been a little bit of a road and you know, tens of, of chips designed in the process and fighting foundries and things like that. But um, also in the past 10 years, the industry has changed a little bit. There's been more demand for optics and so foundries have become more uh, receptive to the idea of integrating optics into their uh, CMOS platforms. And so whereas previously we had to sort of hack in optical designs where the foundry didn't know that we were doing optics in their platform. And uh, you know, we break a few rules and ask for forgiveness later. And um, so to nowadays where part of at least some, some foundries are looking at uh, you know, their business including integrated photonics uh, offerings as part of what they do. So, and that includes global foundries, it includes tower, and it includes um, even TSMC, the leading uh, semiconductor manufacturer. Um, so, this is um, what it looks like to put optics and uh, transistors, uh, this is a cross-section of one of these chips. And uh, so this is now a publicly available platform uh, where you have uh, optical modulators, optical photodiodes, uh, and state-of-the-art RF CMOS transistors in, in one um, manufacturing process. So you design, you send the chip to the foundry and comes back, uh, a chip comes back that has both optics and electronics um, on it. And so that's great, uh, but uh, you know, then we only have a die and then uh, you guys sitting here <laughs> come in because uh, unless you're selling chips for, for a living, you know, to get to uh, something that, that actually makes use of this chip, you have to go the rest of the way. Um, so, um, we'll talk maybe a little bit about that in a minute, but, you know, these chips have uh, to go through flip chip attached, fiber attached, which is uh, the addition compared to electronic chip packaging, and there are a lot of um, complications that that brings with it, as well as light sources, which uh, is some, something that you have to think about integrating because silicon does not uh, emit light. So you have to use three, five semiconductors for, for lasers and light sources. Um, so let me just give you an example of what's possible. This is now an old uh, example. It's about seven years old, but um, might be interesting to this community. So this here is, a, is from one of these foundries, a three by six millimeter chip, which is a microprocessor that has um, compute cores on it. So that's these two here. And it has also integrated photonics on the, um, on the die. So light goes into one of these uh, grading couplers that uh, couple light from uh, out of plane and into the waveguide. And then um, 
you see these little rings here. So several wavelengths of light are coupled into the chip waveguide, and then each ring encodes electrical uh, an electrical data stream onto a different wavelength of light. The radius of the ring determines its resonant wavelength, and so it, you tune the rings to be um, addressing different wavelengths of light. So here you go in, you imprint the data. There's one transmitter, second transmitter, third transmitter, fourth transmitter, and so on. And so you have multi-wavelength, uh, a multi-wavelength data stream where you can take parallel bits and encode them into different wavelengths. Uh, and then it comes out of the chip and then comes back uh, on the other end, and, and so these are receivers with photodiodes. So you can, uh, and if you're interested, in, I'll just give you a, a quick example. So, uh, you know, these chips can boot Linux and uh, uh, they can do stream benchmarks to, to test the memory bandwidth and, and even do 3D rendering of, of a teapot. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about it is that the processor and the memory are 15 meters apart, which you could never do with, you know, an electrical connection um, like in your laptop. Um, so this is sort of a proof of concept showing this disaggregation being possible. Um, and so where this has gone now is, so we spun out a company in 2015, uh, IR Labs, that applied this approach to building chiplets that can integrate with a, um, a computing uh, SOC. And so these are co-packaged on uh, a single, in a single uh, chip package. Uh, this is an FPGA. And then, so uh, with a heat sink, here you, you see a custom designed heat sink to have vertically coupled uh, fibers, which then come out to the, to the front panel of the, of the um, uh, server. So, uh, by the way, uh, just a side point. So, I, I showed you that first microprocessor from seven or eight years ago. So, there, the optical communication, the, these little rings that encode data went at five gigabits per second. And, uh, you know, as of 2020, they, go, they can go up to about 50 or 100 gigabits per second. And they didn't get smaller. The main thing that changed is working closely with the foundry to optimize dopings to refine designs. So there's, there's room to improve these things from sort of, you know, academic basic demonstrations to, to applications, as long as there's enough of a market pull to get a foundry interested to help you. And so this is an application where you can do that. There are some applications where we still can't get interest from foundries, but... Um, so, um, let me sh show you this, uh, this um, optical chiplet technology for, um, for uh, data center disaggregation and for AI HPC. Um, so one, one of the problems, as I mentioned at the beginning, is... Uh, so, yeah, basically, that the, the, um, not only is the power for uh, I.O., uh, the demand for that increasing, and uh, the computation not keeping up, but uh, the projected power uh, for off-chip op communication, if you were not to change the technology, would exceed the total uh, power budget for the uh, thermal power budget for the, uh, for the package. And so that was one of the problems to address. So the, uh, the solution that, uh, that our labs pursued uh, that used this technology of that microprocessor that I showed you is to make a, an I.O. chiplet and basically create a technology called optical I.O. where you integrate these chiplets with whatever high performance um, processor you have and um, you uh, uh, um, you, that, that way you push the data from the electrical to the optical domain. And the idea is to do this with uh, very low energy. Uh, light sources are removed from this problem because they don't help. Uh, lasers are very low uh, wall plug efficiency, so they, they would contribute to the thermal um, uh, budget of the package. And so these chiplets go in with the uh, co-packaged processor, but not the, the light source that's uh, external and comes in over optical fiber. So you connect to the, so this is in the package, and then you go between. And so these can go up, this is single mode fiber, so you can go a couple of kilometers, but most of the applications these days are 50 to 100 meters or less. Um, so just an artist rendering of what it looks like. 
And so this is that five micron resonator, and then it's on a chip with uh, analog drive circuits very close to it, which allows you to have low energy. Then digital logic to, to drive those. Um, and for example, you have uh, interfaces so that, let's say, uh, the processor has a certain uh, standard for, for getting the day out, data out. One example is Intel's AIB advanced interface bus. It's just a sort of uh, an interface for getting out digital data. And um, so the idea is that uh, you have a, in this chiplet, first a, a digital layer that translates the interfaces to the, that chip and um, the processor and converts the, uh, or interfaces that data to the uh, transmitters and receivers, and then the transmitters and receivers circuits drive the optical um, modulators, photodiodes. Uh, and at the end here, you have, uh, you have optical fibers. And so when you put this chiplet and several others in here, so one, one edge here is one of these uh, fiber attached points. So you can see it here in a little bit more detail. The fiber goes over here. Uh, there are three fibers uh, or three ports per trans transceiver because uh, the laser is external. So the laser comes in, you encode the data, then it comes out, and then what's coming from the other guy comes back in the third port to the re to receivers here. So that's what it looks like. And uh, so the circuits that, that drive these optics uh, in the middle and then the electrical interface. So that's how these chiplets uh, look. Um, and so I'll maybe skip this to, other than to say that uh, what this is showing is that you can have uh, eight physical ports, eight fibers, and then each fiber has eight wavelengths. So that's, let's say, 64 channels times, um, say, 10 gigabits per second would be 640 gig. And actually, these are faster, so you, you have 10, uh, two terabits per chiplet. Um, and, um, so then you need a light source, and so these are just examples of, of uh, some of these multi-wavelength light sources that power uh, these communication links. Um, so the, the idea is to build these kind of triplets on 300 millimeter wafers, and then um, you know, integrate them with SOCs, package them, and so on. So this is a high volume application in the sense that um, it's um, something that you do with 300 millimeter foundries and OSAT um, uh, packaging vendors. But there's a lot of uh, opportunity for um, bringing new capabilities into integrated photonics that don't yet have a pull and that a lot of the academic community or uh, government labs like Lincoln Lab are working towards. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of, uh, let's say, further out um, uh, needs and, and what integrated photonics might do, but that aren't yet uh, at least being deployed from, from the work that we're doing. Uh, and one of them is uh, for RF and millimeter wave uh, circuits for antenna beam forming. So this is just an example of, uh, of a phased array antenna. So eight by eight, uh, and the point is that if you have RF signals at, let's say, 50 gigahertz, which is the um, new frequencies coming for automotive radar or uh, 5G and 6G, um, if you have uh, 50 to 100 gigahertz frequencies, you have a bunch of uh, phase array elements. Well, these are lower frequency, but um, they'll be much smaller on, on, a, on a board. Um, so you have elements, and each element uh, of the antenna, you want to um, measure the signal waveform, communicate it to an FPGA, and then do digital beamforming to figure out where the signal is coming from. So, so uh, one way to do that is to have uh, a uh, analog to digital converter, and then uh, communication links like the chips that I showed you for uh, these data centers just a minute ago. Uh, and that's fine, but these analog to digital converters cost a lot of power, especially at high frequencies. And so, uh, in more in the research, so this is probably going to be the, the first thing that, that gets used, but uh, much low, a much lower energy approach would be to uh, just go direct uh, with an optical chiplet into, to encode the voltage of the received radio wave and 
a carrier um, uh, substrate and then on a, on a PC, PCB. And then we have a little chip here that has um, here an amplifier and optical modulator um, uh, times um, 24. So 24 sites and 15 millimeters. And uh, so if you have a, a 70 gigahertz antenna that you, you have a pitch of about two millimeters, so you would have on this same area about 25 antenna elements. And so there's enough of these basically to pick up every element that would be there on a 70 gig antenna. Um, and so here you can see one zoom in into one of these. So this here is transistors and, um, and um, well, it's not very easy to see, uh, and uh, inductors on chip. So it's a low noise amplifier with 30 dB gain. And then here you see uh, multiple cavity um, uh, modulator that's designed to do this. So some initial data just um, showing that this low noise, low noise amplifier does amplify around 57 gigahertz in this case, and then some initial measurements of the noise figure. So this is the kind of thing that we're looking into. And you can go so far using silicon only like we're doing here. But you can do much better if we could integrate, for example, uh, electro-optic materials like, uh, like um, uh, EO polymers. Uh, let me see how I'm doing with time here. 12.50, so I should be done right about now. Is that right? I don't know if we started a little late or not. Um, so um, maybe I'll just spend uh, five minutes on going through the other two examples, which are a little bit more far out. Um, one other application is uh, to make uh, systems on chip that can be used in quantum net opt optical networks. So this is a little bit uh, further than classical data communication. And uh, so the idea is just to make the way that you would design a, a chip you know, um, using different IP blocks, like an ARM core processor that you instantiate in your design, different parts, and then you can design your own custom parts of the chip. We wanted to design components that you can uh, instantiate on a chip and have, for example, a, a single photon source or uh, a single photon detector, these kind of things. And um, so, again, uh, there's what you, what you can do in silicon alone or uh, potentially co-packaging or, or hybrid integrating um, uh, non-CMOS materials at the packaging stage would be nice to be able to do. This is easier, of course, to commercialize, but for some things you might need um, something that you can't get in the CMOS foundry, at least not right away, and at least not until the volume is large enough that they'll play with you. Um, so this, I just want to show you a picture of this. Here's a, some uh, driver circuits, digital logic and analog controllers, and then these uh, shiny uh, sort of things here are wires going underneath, because we're looking at the photonic circuit from the back. So this is a, a quantum correlated photon pair source that uses one resonator as a nonlinear um, generator of photons and some other bandpass filters in here. And um, so the point is, there's one thing we need to do, for example, is lock this resonator to the wavelength of light by tuning it and seeing if the resonator is on. So there's a feedback control between the electronics and the optics. Um, and uh, so, for example, I'll just show you here what's happening. So this is just showing that um, this controller drives the resonator, sees if there's photocurrent, finds where it's resonant, and then goes back and locks it on. And so here you can see this green line is an indicator of having 20,000 quantum correlated photons per second coming out of that chip. Um, and so the, the idea is to try to build on top of this. So now that you have this little um, device, you can, you can um, put several of them on a, on a chip. So here's one, two, three, four, and you can use them as building blocks. And so this is still a work in progress, but that's um, kind of the idea. Um, and then um, last thing I want to show you is um, uh, work on, on superconducting interconnects. And um, the idea is that uh, there's these AI and HPC applications are calling for a lot of compute, that you need a lot of computation per unit uh, power. So people have been coming up with uh, you know, these wafer scale processors like Cerebras, and uh, Tesla also has been doing this in a different way. 
Uh, and um, these also have to do with uh, disaggregation. So what they're doing basically is putting all these chips on a wafer, and so the memory is outside. So, so again, you need uh, efficient communication. But uh, one interesting thing that could be in the future and could be very exciting and kind of a moonshot is to replace then, since all this computation, all these compute processors are together, you can replace them by superconducting electronics, which is a technology that's been around in research for decades, uh, but hasn't really uh, hit uh, prime time in terms of application in, in large volume. And uh, these technologies exist, and one of the best foundries for this research foundries, at least, is at uh, MIT Lincoln Lab in our area. So it would be interesting to build a supercomputer inside a cryostat. And there is lots of work that people have been doing replacing field effect transistors in silicon with Josephson junctions. Um, but the idea is that you can gain in the power by a, a couple of orders of magnitude uh, using this, even after you account for the cooling powers and everything else. And so, um, one application then, since the memory is separate and outside and at room temperature, is to connect these superconducting processors to uh, memory chips at room temperature. And these superconducting processors have not one volt, but one millivolt signals. So it's a much harder problem. And so again, that's why it's now in research rather than uh, you know, sort of the next stage, trying to make these modulators and detectors even more efficient uh, and sensitive. Um, but just to show you an example, here there's a, again a, a small amplifier and one of these um, ring modulators integrated together. And uh, here they're sitting in a cryostat where on one side is a superconducting uh, chip and on the other side is this, uh, this chip that we have um, and that's driving uh, the drive signal is uh, two millivolts, actually amplified to four millivolts and uh, uh, so you can see uh, you know, an open eye diagram outside uh, at room temperature. So that's kind of exciting. Um, but you can see that uh, this is all glued together in a lab type environment. And so the cool thing would be to have a superconducting processor and a, uh, one of these CMOS um, chips that has uh, optical I.O., just like for those uh, high performance FPGAs uh, on the same package in a multi-chip module. So here, this is a uh, part way, we're sort of on the way to do this. Uh, this is where the superconducting chip goes. This is uh, our optical I.O. chiplet already there, and the, this uh, carrier here is a superconducting substrate. Um, so, um, that's all I have for you, and I, I guess my, my thoughts uh, about um, where we are is, on the one hand, there's um, this uh, data uh, I.O. and uh, in package I.O. need as well as uh, sort of data center communication, which already there are multiple companies, I.O. Labs, Renovus, uh, uh, there are many, Hyperlite is a, a startup from the area um, from Harvard doing uh, lithium niobate modulators. Uh, and that's, that's a need that's already seen in the industry. On the other hand, uh, so, and, and all of this, you know, you work with a foundry and you develop this in 300 millimeter processes and all the packaging happens in uh, Asia right now where the, the, there are these high volume um, vendors. On the other hand, I showed you some university glue, ta glue and, and, and tape, uh, you know, demonstrations. But really the, the research we're doing is compatible with taking it all the way to um, application. And so I think one very useful thing would be close interaction with experts in, in packaging who to, to make demonstrations that are one, at lower cost, and two, in a, in a way that is a stepping stone, to, stone towards these high volume um, or medium volume applications rather than sort of just one, one off, two off demos that end up in a, in a nature paper and sort of get put in the drawer. Um, so it would be nice to have the ability to um, do sort of prototyping where we send some of these chips to a foundry, as we do now, but then we want to integrate uh, some sort of, uh, come up with a custom in, um, hybrid integration process onto the chip after uh, it comes back, and uh, to, to integrate new materials that are now in the foundry. And so this is somewhere where, for example, there are small startups in Europe 
uh, coming up like FIX and uh, well, the Tenant Institute where you can sort of develop a process with them, pay them a few tens of thousands of dollars to package a few chips for you and that's okay. Um, you know, as long as there's a low volume or medium volume sort of on the other end uh, of that, they're, they're interested and it would be great to have that kind of experimenting in between environments, uh, between university and sort of high volume where, where the industry already recognizes a thousand, thousand way per starts a day kind of applications. There are also medium volume applications or just not at the volume yet. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you. Um, everybody give a big hand for him. And uh, the afternoon sessions will be starting momentarily. Uh, don't forget to check out the exhibitors too while you're at it. And uh, raffles will be starting, you know, maybe at two to three o'clock or so. And we'll have your name on the board. So if you're in session with the raffle tickets called, you won't lose that. We'll wait until the end of the day to replace it if you're not here. Thank you. <laughs>